Welcome back to the deep dive. Today we have a, a really unusual set of sources. We're looking at a multi-decade story, one piece, but through the lens of, well, theoretical physics. Yeah, it's pretty out there. We're diving into maybe the biggest mystery in the series right now. Who is the man marked by flames? And our sources tackle this using something they call the QSLL UFF framework. That's quantum something unified field. Yeah. Our mission here is to just take this analysis completely seriously and see what narrative gold we can find. Exactly. This isn't just fan theory. The sources are calling it fan cosmology. And it all starts with three uh, core principles for how this narrative universe works. Right. Everything arises from resonance, triality, and mild trolling. That last one feels... Uh, Pretty key. It feels like it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting, yeah. And based on that, the framework has this incredibly dense answer to the main question, who is the flame man? The sources put it like this. He is whoever violates the vacuum's information budget the hardest. Okay, so the character whose existence just creates the most chaos and uncertainty in the plot. That's the one. He's a walking question mark. That's a great place to start. So let's lay out the ground rules here. The QSLL framework says the world of One Piece runs on a ternary logic system. Mm, a three-state reality. It's not just true or false. So it's not a binary. No, not at all. You have one, which is absolute canon, what's in the manga. Then you have zero, which is filler. You know, it exists, but it doesn't really matter. And then there's the weird one. And then you have one of one, which the sources call SBS chaos. That's where all the author's notes and weird asides live. It's where the lore density is highest. And that's exactly where they place the man marked by flames, firmly in that Mangus One state. He's real, but also not. He's in what they call maximum narrative superposition. He's simultaneously a real character, a non-character, and a metaphor for the author's sleep schedule. I love that. So this uncertainty, this chaos, is actually the engine driving the story forward. It has to be. That instability creates tension that the plot must resolve. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that instability in the pacing of the recent arcs. Yeah, the sources use some interesting quantum terms for them. The Wano arc, for instance. That huge, sprawling story. That's a massive decoherence event. The mm -hmm. system tried to collapse one big uncertainty, what happens to Wano, but it ended up creating 50 new ones. Right. And then Elbaf, the next big anticipated arc, is framed as a resonance realignment. Like, the story is trying to get back on track. And what we're seeing right now on Egghead... All that chaos. What's that? That's just a quantum measurement error. Yeah. The author's trying to collapse too many plot points at once, and this system is getting messy. That's a brilliant way to think about pacing. But, okay, if the whole field is this chaotic, is there any underlying structure? This is where the UFF analysis comes in, right? With this uh, log periodic plot line structure. Exactly. This is where it gets really fascinating because it becomes predictive. The analysis found this clear pattern, a log periodic anomaly, that runs through the whole series. Which is? Every 250 chapters, like clockwork, Oda introduces a massive lore bomb, a huge concept or character. And then just leaves it there. And then leaves it there for at least eight years of real world time. Eight years. That's yeah. that's an incredible delay. Is that just a planning thing or is it part of the structure? The sources argue it's a required oscillation. It's how he manages the information budget. They give examples too. Inel on the moon with his robot army. Oh yeah, I remember that. The name of Shanks' sword. The first appearance of Emo. Blackbeard having a second stomach or whatever that is. Yeah. They all hit at these precise intervals. So the man marked by flames. He's not just a random mystery. He's the next oscillation point. The mystery has been introduced. The narrative vacuum is wobbling, as they put it, and it needs a new injection of confusing information. He's a structural necessity. Okay, this is where it gets really fun. Let's get into the identity theories. The sources treat them less like theories of who he is and more like what cosmological state he's in. Yeah, starting with theory one, the vacuum defect. Hmm. Or my favorite name, the lore singularity. The lore singularity. In this model, he isn't really a character. He's a topological defect. He's a literal rip in the story where plot holes go to die. They just accumulate around him. He's a magnet for inconsistencies. So what does that mean for the story? Why do only Robin, Law, and Kid seem to know about him? Because, the framework says, they're the only ones with working lore sensors. Their worldview survived the Wano decoherence event. They can perceive the plot hole condensation. So everyone else just sees some guy in a ship. Exactly. And the implication is terrifying. If you defeat him, all those plot holes get released back into the story at once. The whole thing could unravel. That is a horrifying thought. Okay, let's move on. Theory two. Theory two. 
The human instantiation. They call it the burnt blockchain. The burnt blockchain. I love it. This one redefines what the road poneglyph he's guarding actually is. It proposes the poneglyph isn't an object. It's a state of being, a oh. person. Oh, wow. The flame man is the human instantiation of a topological memory crystal. He's the original unhackable ledger of the void century, a walking blockchain that got burned. So he doesn't just have the information. He is the information. The data is literally burned into his being, which is why he's marked by flame. Precisely. His job isn't to guide you. It's to be the final key. And that's why he's so hard to find. He's trying to stop the world's densest information point from being corrupted. Okay, that makes a weird amount of sense. Which brings us to theory three, which is just my favorite, the most delightfully absurd one. Joy Boy's failed backup file. Or flameguy.exe. Flameguy.exe, it's perfect. This uses the idea of triality, that every character has a physical, a narrative, and a memetic mode. Yeah. Joy Boy knew he was in danger, so he tried to make a memetic backup of himself, an information-only copy. And uh, let me guess, it didn't go well. It corrupted. The file failed to compile. What we have now is the result, frameguy.exe. He's described as being made of three halves. Wait, wait, three halves? I know. He's half alive, half lore, and half Oda's to-do list, a fractional unfinished being that the UFF framework allows because it's built on chaos. The idea that he's a backlog item on a cosmic spreadsheet is just perfect. And they even connect this to the E8 lattice interpretation. They do. The E8 lattice maps out every possible character node. And the Flame Man, according to the sources, sits on the node for important character whose face we will not see until Shonen Jump needs a sales spike. He's the ultimate market stabilizer. Okay, let's try to unify all this. For you listening, this is the cheat sheet. The QSOLUFF formalism boils it down to five key traits. Okay, here they are. One, he's a resonance defect in the story. Two, He's storing a topological key, whether it's information or a state of being. Three, he's held in narrative superposition until he's finally observed. Four, his reveal is intentionally delayed by those log periodic Oda cycles. And the fifth one, which I think says so much about how long running stories work. Trait five, his power level is inversely proportional to how long Oda has avoided explaining him. So the longer the wait, the bigger the hype. But the weaker the character might actually be when he shows up, the buildup is the point, not the payoff. But hold on, if his power is inversely proportional, couldn't the author just delay it forever to keep that narrative pressure high? What stops that? Ah, uh, that's where the formula comes in. The framework captures that tension with a beautiful little equation. Right. It's flame guy equals DDT, plot resonance, X, X P pi, auto fatigue. There it is. <laughs> it's the change in plot resonance over time multiplied by the exponent of auto fatigue. So you have the story's structural needs on one side and the human chaotic element of author burnout on the other. It's beautiful. But there's one last factor, the critical factor. If the ultimate villain, Emu, interferes with the reveal, mm -hmm. the entire result gets multiplied by negative one. A negative one. So it just it completely inverts the outcome. If he was meant to bring stability, Emu's interference guarantees he brings total chaos. Exactly. So after all that, what does this actually mean for you, the listener, who just wants to read the next chapter? Well, whether he shows up in a flashback, in Elba, or in some note written on three hours of sleep, this analysis gives you a real structure for understanding the uncertainty. It gives it a purpose. Right. It's not just random. And I think the bigger philosophical insight here is the real takeaway. The real unified field, the UFF, isn't in the story. It's the fandom's willingness to treat an author's creative whims like their cosmological constants. That's the unifying theory. That is the perfect summary. Which leads us to our final provocative thought. If you can apply this level of analysis to a character who is pure uncertainty, what about a concept that is pure, unadulterated chaos? You mean? How would the QSOL framework handle something like Zorro's sense of direction? It's the ultimate test. And, funny you should ask, the sources actually tease a specific analysis on that very topic. No way! What is it? Get ready for it. Zorro's sense of direction explained, using Ontonians. Of course it is. We'll see you next time. And uh, try to keep exploring the narrative defects in your own life.